Um, I'm happy to uh, to host the next uh, session here from from my side, and I'm going to share my screen as well. I hope you can see it now as well. Yes, we can see. Mm -hmm. So I would like to use the next 40 minutes or so to talk a little bit about what we've uh, developed in the last uh, one year or two years, a concept for building or engineering systems or let's say engineering parts of systems um, which we can um, which we can use uh, for 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 uh, to shape crypto economic um, states so uh, what i'm going to walk you through today is uh, how actually engineering of systems works and how you can use mathematical methods to architect such systems and we used bonding curves which some of you might be familiar with as an example to show how you can impose a structure onto a crypto economy so i would like to start with the end actually so i would like to start with uh, the key takeaways so for you to to see what what will be the highlights of the talks and what uh, what you can take with you or what what you should what you should understand if you listen to this presentation so uh, th these are the four uh, key points for key messages that I want to transport today. So I want to say that when we talk about crypto economic systems, that we will talk about multi-scale complex systems that have an universal temper proof state layer. So this is something that we didn't have in economics so far. So we didn't have economies where we could describe a state in such a way as we can do today in crypto economies, because we have the blockchain. And the blockchain facilitates this state layer that everyone, every user or every agent in the system can observe. So now, as an engineer of this crypto economic system, we can impose additional structure onto the economy. So we can say this economy should develop in one specific direction. So we can restrict future states and we can build so-called configuration spaces this is we can create sp a space in which the, the economy will ev evolve to and we will use bonding curves to drive this direction once we have this state layer of the economy developed we can um, let agents play economic games on top of this infrastructure so now we could also connect to state-based game theory. So we could apply research that we have to say, okay, now that we have a space where agents play something or do something or interact with this economy, now we can adopt the machinery from uh, state-based game theory to describe these interactions and to make modeling and, and, um, and predictions how this game might play out in the future. And once we have this, we even can connect to distributed control and optimization theory. So we can say, okay, now that we see how the system might, might evolve over time, how the agents might behave over time, we can try to control the system in some way. So if you look at this, so this should be the big picture of the presentation. If you have a network, with the universal state layer. So you have a network and, and a blockchain, right? So you have an economic system and network of agents that use the blockchain to do something. And you can combine these two things to describe the system as a state space. So you, you can say everything that we can observe in these economic games can be described by these variables, by these small x in the big in the set of big x so this would be all of the possible states that the system can be in and this would be an actual state that the system is in and now with this we can do two things we can use bonding curves to restrict this space so we can say okay 
these are all of the possibilities of the system state, but we will restrict it to a subspace, to a smaller space. We will say, okay, we do not allow everything to happen in the future. We only allow a small fraction of things to happen in the future. So this would be the one content of my talk, of my presentation. And the second thing that we can use with this is we can apply game theory and in particular a special branch of game theory, which is a state-based potential games theory that was developed by Jason R. Marden. So how do I want to structure my talk? I would uh, give a short overview or reminder what crypto economic systems are, how these systems can be described as complex systems. We will introduce some definitions and properties. Then I will guide you through um, two papers that um, uh, were written during the last year by my colleagues and I, uh, which uh, summarized the findings on bonding curves, configuration spaces and games as estimators. And then we can have a brief outlook to population games, evolutionary dynamic games, uh, game theory and distributed control, state-based potential games, and also cooperative control and potential games. So this would be what I want to present in the next 35 minutes or so. Um, and I hope that you're going to stay with me for this. Okay. So let's look back. What are complex systems or wh why do we talk about crypto economies and com uh, as complex systems? Because our economy consists of subsystems that are connected to each other and they are interdependent. So you do not have one thing that you observe, but you have many different components, many, many specific parts of the economic systems which might be the market, which might be the token, which might be some interactions going on. And you cannot disentangle these things from each other. So effects and or interactions in one of the subsystems will have influence and feedback loops to other parts. So you have always to describe crypto economies as a whole. Another property is the time dimension. So um, complex systems or crypto economies are dynamic. So time plays a role. You cannot take a snapshot of, of the economy and try to understand it. You always have to look at the evolution. You always have to look at, at the dynamics. In some sense, you have control applications. So this would mean that you would like to guide the system in, in, in a specific way. So similar to a rocket ship that wants to fly to the moon that can apply different controls you as an engineer or you as an agent can interact with the system and you can apply some specific controls that are to be designed obviously and that uh, which can be designed centrally or even decentrally right so this is the huge benefit of crypto economies you have the decentralized control mechanisms and if you design or if you look at these complex systems, you have to look at them from different perspectives. So it's not a, 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 a simple thing to look on. And you have to be aware that they, th these things are layered. So you have the macro economy as a whole, but you can go deeper and deeper into every layer. And then you will finally arrive at the micro level where you have agents uh, having interactions taking place. And these layers are interconnected. So each of them should uh, should connect uh, to each other. Um, uh, to the top, you should go into contextualization. So you should you should always, if you model or if you look at a specific part of the economy, you should you should ask yourself how does this connect to the layer above. And uh, if you look at the, uh, to to one layer below, you should always ask yourself how are the effects or how are the things that you observe on one specific layer. How are they consistent to what is happening on the lower level? So you have micro foundations. Everything that you try to build above should be consistent with everything that you have below. And once you have this, you can, you can apply crypto economics, which in my view is economics on steroids, right? So you would try to take these possible outcomes and to build some kind of incentive structure. You should build some kind of gravitation. So you should say you can guide the system in one specific way. You can build purpose driven systems. And here you can think of the Bitcoin network, for example, where you have the purpose of exchanging value. 
or you can think of the Ethereum network where you think of the purpose of distributed computation. So these are the things that the network is designed to do. And if you build it or if you're in the process of building these systems, you should always keep in mind that this is the purpose that you want to achieve. And you want to attract all of the users in order to so that their actions follow specific guidelines that bring the whole network into this direction. Uh, but uh, since you have heavy computation and since you have um, a lot of data available, uh, real time live data, uh, so this would be represented by this, uh, by this uh, little sketch. Uh, you, you you would have much more information available than in usual um, economic or in usual, uh, let's say, um, heuristic models of interactions. So you really can take this data, you can uh, make these packages uh, um, compute very efficiently and and therefore you can really, really bring very strong methods to the table. So you can do not have to rely on simplifications. You do not have to rely on linearizations, but you can build very complex, connected, dynamic uh, economic models in real time that you can observe, but also guide or control to in one specific sense. So these concepts have been described uh, in the foundational paper of crypto economic systems, which is also the research roadmap of our institute. It was published uh, in uh, November or October 2019 by Sherman Voschmier and Michael Zarkham. Uh, and it was also accepted to the MIT um, crypto economic systems the journal uh, just recently. So this is the paper that outlines what crypto economic systems are, how to do complex systems engineering and which principles to apply. And the, the main message is that you have to do uh, uh, interdisciplinary research. And this is why we are here for. So the conference here that you're attending is, is on purpose interdisciplinary. And that if you look at this multi-layered, uh, multi-stage agent systems, you have to look at the things um, in a way that I described already before. So you have macroeconomic models, you have mesoeconomic models and microeconomic models, which are connected. And the microeconomic models provide foundations from what you see in the global economy and the macroeconomic models uh, provide context to what, uh, to what is happening in the microeconomic models. Uh, and uh, I personally, or my agenda is the engineering approach. So what I'm asking myself all the time when I'm working or when I'm researching is, is the one simple question, how to build these systems. And in order to build them, we have to follow the on engineering approach. So we have an ongoing process, which consists of many iterations and improvements happening all the time. And the design is supported by computer aided analysis. So what does this mean? You start with a specification, you build a model, you try to capture what's going on, and then you can you can implement this model into simulation software. You can simulate the model, you can see how the economy might develop. Then you can you can tune the economy, so you can say, okay, we will change specific parameters, we will change specific structures, and then you go back into model modeling. So this is the engineering approach of complex systems engineering, and this uh, in more detail looks a little bit like this. Uh, you have to start with a system specification of a dynamic model and an economic model of the economy that you try to build. Then you can, you can design a digital twin of the economy. So you can say, okay, this is the computer program that resembles what's going on in the economy very well. And I can play around with this computer program and I can see what might happen, what could happen, or how to structure the economy or the, or the um, incentive mechanisms in a way uh, such that um, such that the um, the things that are intend to happen will happen. This digital twin can be simulated then, and economic analysis can be done on the results. Then you would have to feed back uh, back into the system specification, which is again something that is described uh, here in this in this more simple diagram. But once you are pretty confident that you like what you see, you can go into implementation of the model. So you can go into building implementation in the sense of building the infrastructure of coding the blockchain economy, the crypto economy that you want to build. And next, you should look into legal compliance. So how to operate the system, make it operational and 
once you're done, you're not ready yet. So you do not, you're not finished. You would then feedback into the digital twin, which you would use to, to maintain the economy. So you would have, you would have during the operational phase, you would still keep going and you would still go, go here again and again and again to make improvements on the economy when it is live. And in my presentation today, I would like to focus on this modeling thing here. I will use bonding curves to uh, mostly to model stuff and also to, to, to see a little bit how it does it go in line with simulation. And also I highlighted the, the part that, 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 is, that is mostly relevant to my presentation today as well here. Uh, so uh, uh, why is this difficult what you're doing and why does it take so much time or what, why is it so complicated? Uh, it, it is because we want to apply um, engineering models to, uh, to, to soci sociology and to behavioral economics. So if you look at this scale, I mean, don't think of it as a purity. Think of it a little bit more as abstraction, right? So if you look inside, you see, okay, we want to mathematically model something. We have different tools. Um, and different branches of mathematics, you could say, to use. And we want to transport them here to, to this ap applied side to sociologists that have different understandings of the world, as they can see, and different explanations, right? So, so bridging this gap, so building this bridge is um, very, very difficult and takes a lot of time. So, so, so this is also one of the challenges that we have. Okay, so this was a quick re review of, of complex systems engineering, what we're here for and what we're going to, uh, and what we're about to, to build. Now let's get, go dig deeper into bonding curves and configuration spaces. So most of you who hear the word bonding curves or who observe the market probably have an understanding of bonding curves in a way that they say, okay, a bonding curve is a market design mechanism, right? So it is used to design specific things in crypto economics market and mostly as an alternative means of funding. So there are people who, are, who want to use bonding curves to finance their project. Uh, but also there are, uh, it is in use as a financial instrument. Uh, so you have, uh, for example, Banco, which is a continuous liquidity mechanism. So you have, uh, or an exchange, exchange mechanism. So you have a market maker, you have a continuous liquidity mechanism that can do something in the crypto economic space. And it's programmed in a way that it does something. Um, but the, altogether, crypto economic curves are systems where agents can bond token to mint token and they can burn token to withdraw token. So it, it is simply um, an, a contract where, which in, with which you can interact and you can say, okay, I can um, pay in some DAI, I can pay in some Ethereum, and then I will receive a specific amount of token in return. But the amount of token or the price of this exchange is determined by the bonding curve. So this would be what most uh, what, what's a common understanding of what bonding curves are. Um, in some sense, uh, bonding curves can represent rights. This is very interesting because we think of token as rights. And uh, uh, in continuous organizations, they, they, it, they can be future revenues, so rights to future revenues. And in the augmented bonding curve example, which you might have heard of, um, uh, the token that you have are rights to steer the funds in one specific direction uh, in a non-for-profit non organization. And again, so this is also one, uh, one of the most familiar picture to, to, to people when, when we talk to them about bonding curves is, is, is exactly this, right? So you have this curve that determines um, on the one hand, on the X axis, you have the supply, on the Y axis, you have the reserve, and it determines the price of the reserve uh, of the uh, reserve supply token uh, in accordance to to the what's going on in the market and they there are already very cool implementations of this so you can go to the common stack uh, web page where you can look at the augmented bonding curves uh, they simulated they, they made this application based on 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 this research from from block science where they said okay uh, you can choose uh, your own parameters for your bonding curve here, and you can choose um, uh, other parameters for the for the funding phase. And then you will see uh, how the price of the of the token will develop over over time, or uh, in accordance to the collateral that is that is uh, placed. Okay, uh, but um, we took this as, as a starting point. So bonding curves, we, we, we looked at them from a scientific perspective. And then we said, okay, we can use them 
to design markets. So we can use them to design space. Uh, and there was this recent publication from about five years ago, published by um, Dr. Marty Falcom, Dr. Jim Chorish, and also me here, uh, where we uh, contributed to the working paper series of the VU and, uh, and handed in our paper for the ICBC conference in Toronto. And uh, it was accepted um, in the poster track, um, uh, highlighting all, all the relevant features of the paper. Unfortunately, the, the conference is um, not taking place because of the current circumstances, but, but we will uh, be able to hold this conference online as well. Um, so what is the content of this paper? The content uh, starts with a state space representation of the multi-scale crypto economic system. So it says, okay, how to formalize a crypto economic system. This is the first part of the paper. In introducing some variables, introducing some definitions and saying, this is the space that we are talking about. And then a definition of the configuration space, a concept that I will explain um, in, in a few minutes, which has the very strong um, property that it can uphold the SIAD system level properties. So this is, this is very crucial to understand what we can do with this configuration space. We can hold some, uh, some things um, invariant to change. So we can, up, up, we can basically keep things constant. And this is, this is great. And this is, because, this is something that an engineer likes to do. So why is this so amazing? Uh, because we can reduce the complexity of the problem. Uh, we do not have to, to be concerned what, what might happen in the future with the system because we can restrict the possible future states to one subspace of the space that we started with. And this concept um, is um, illustrated in the paper um, with the example of the augmented bonding curve where exactly these things, the state space representation, the configuration space, and the invariant conservation functions are uh, applied and, or, uh, or are um, defined for this special case. And then this model or this, this um, simulation is, um, is, um, is, is experimented with. So you, have, you can also derive uh, numerical results. So what is this configuration space that we are talking about? Uh, think about the space that I introduced in the very beginning of my presentation. So this is all the possible future system states that you can have. And this is one particular uh, system space that you are in. You could think, if you look outside of the window, you can you can talk you can think of the world, right? So this this small x would be the state of the world as we see today. It could it, it could be um, basically every state, right? So all of the parameters could change, people could move, things would happen. But we choose one particular state. And if we would like to see how this state transition is taking place, so how this state changes over time, we would have to apply one uh, state transition function, so one mechanism, which is basically a function depending of the previous state and all of the actions taking place in the system. So you would say, okay, you, have, you are in this state, then agents, people do something with this state, and then they land in another system state, in a future system state, which is X prime. But having the bonding curve as a mechanism or as a tool uh, at hand, you can now restrict this space. And this is what it's actually all about. So you can make this, this possible future state smaller. So you can say that you can design the future in a way that you would force the system to land in one particular um, in one particular um, set of possibilities. So having this configuration space assures that you cannot land here, which is again, nice because you can, you can drive the system to one particular direction. And why is this possible? This is possible because you introduce some invariant properties. So you say everything, regardless what happens, all future states here, and all previous states have to fulfill this condition. You can think again of the Bitcoin network, for example, where you say the interactions taking place would be the transactions between the agents. So value is transferred. But what is kept constant to some extent, because not really, but what is kept constant is the amount of total token in circulation. 
So um, not taking um, a monetary supply, increasement of monetary supply every, uh, every few blocks um, into consideration, we would say that the number of token, total token uh, uh, in the system is kept constant. So all of the interactions taking place must, uh, uh, must um, fulfill this restriction, must uh, respect the restriction of that the total sum of the account uh, numbers is one specific number. This might be still a little bit tricky, uh, but uh, it's much easier to think of, as the, uh, uh, on the, of the configuration space if you think about this. I've been talking about the reduction of dimensionality. So imagine that you are someone floating in the three-dimensional space. You are someone in the universe and you have nothing to hold on. So the actions or the directions that you could go to are three. You can go uh, forward, you can go upwards, or you can go uh, right, left. Um, so you have a three-dimensional action space or future state possibilities. But now think about adding structure to this space. If you add structure, this means that you have, for example, a planet. And this planet is uh, based in this space. And this planet um, represents um, uh, it. Um, the, this pre planet uh, it fulfills one specific condition. So the surface of this planet, the surface of the Earth, is a two-dimensional subspace because uh, it keeps one thing invariant. The invariant is the distance to the center. So now. Imagine that you are on the planet of Earth on the surface. And now you do not have so many uh, possibilities to go to because you only have two dimensions you can go to. You can go, um, you can go uh, in front or, or behind or you can go left or right. Because gravity holds you to some extent um, on top of the Earth on the surface. And agents playing games on, on the surface are restricted to play these games on the surface of the Earth. So, so this is what a, a reduction in dimensionality can be thought of. So you can, you can really imagine you being floating in space first, not having the possibility to, um, to restrict uh, directions. But then if you force populations or if you force people to play, to, to, be, to, to um, interact on one specific uh, su subspace, which is the surface of the Earth, then you have reduced the problem. Maybe another, an even simpler example is if you have a dog in your yard, right? So uh, if you if you don't do, do anything, the dog can can access all of the of the of the, um, uh, the whole yard, right? So you, it can go anywhere it, it desires. It can be very happy. But uh, if you imagine um, putting a, like a stick somewhere into the yard and and even um, chaining or, or binding the, the dog to the stick, then you would restrict his options. And you can restrict it in a way that his actions or his, his movements can only happen on the circle in the yard. So you would also reduce his possibilities to a one-dimensional subspace of the plane of the yard. So this is what the designer or the engineer now has to, to make use of um, um, to design systems, right? But you have to be careful here. You really have to uh, to make sure that uh, if you think of the dog, you, you don't you can't use um, 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 a chain or you can you can't use you can't use anything that is moving because you want to restrict him to move on the circle line, right? And not on the whole circle because the whole circle would again be two dimensional. But if you restrict him in a way that you say that this distance here has to be constant as well, then you would restrict him to, to, to be on the line. Okay, so now let's uh, dig deeper into, uh, into the, um, uh, the formalism of this. So how do you do this? So uh, um, I mentioned this before, you have to define stuff. And now the next slides are pretty mathematical, but I hope that you can, you can cope with it. So um, you would start with defining the state which summarizes the system at a given point in time. So this is every observation that you can make of, of the system are summarized by the system state. And then you define actions. So you can you allow actions to choose an action defined depending on the state that you are in. And you can say that you can you can alter the system state by doing actions. 
And how do you alter the system? You can say, okay, you can define a mechanism. You can say, okay, given a state and an action, then you will reach a future state. So this is actually the, the F that we had before. And uh, uh, by doing so, you will also introduce state transitions. So you say the new X, X prime will be a function of exactly this at a given time, given all the actions and given all the mechanisms that you have at hand. And here, table one relates um, agent behavior to system state. So you see that on the agent scale, uh, you, have, you have to define action sets. You can say, okay, this is what, what possibly you can do. You define mechanisms, you allow agents to take interactions. And um, then you will lead into the system. This will, this will result in the system changes. And um, so you will, you, you see that only possible thing is, is for a system is the configuration space. So you don't have the whole system space anymore. You have only the configuration space, which can be realized given actions uh, and uh, pr pr previous states. So uh, now you would define conservation functions. You would define this V so that you say, okay, you can encode a desired property. When you think of the dog, you would say that the radius has to be constant. If, if you think of the world, you would also say, okay, this radius between the sphere and the center, uh, the plane, the surface of the sphere and the, and the center has to be constant. And these conservation functions would be said to be invariant if it is equal for all the states. So it, it doesn't change over time. And this is, uh, this is proposed here, where we say that regardless whether how many future states we reach, that every, con that every the value function will stay constant, will stay the same uh, for, all, um, for all the realizations. So now you then derive the configuration space, which is a proper subset of the general state space. So instead of having uh, the possibility to transition to the general X prime, you only have the possibility to transition to the next um, future state, uh, which is the configuration space, which is X C prime. Okay, so uh, let's look into the augmented bonding curve now. Uh, how does this apply? You would define the state space and you would define the invariant properties. So you would say, okay, well, uh, you, you introduce uh, the variables R for the reserved uh, quantity, you would introduce a supply, you would introduce the funding pool, you would introduce the spot price. And uh, then you would all together, these four would, would form the system state, which is X uh, encoded by R, S, P, and F. And you would say that you want to keep this constant. So you want to conserve the ratio of the supply and the R. This is exactly what makes you land on the curve that you know uh, or are familiar with from bonding curves. So given this, uh, given this uh, conservation function, you will always follow this curve. So this would be the restriction. You would, you would force all the agents to play this game on this curve and where they would derive the spot price. So uh, interacting with the curve would tell them what is the, the current price that I can acquire token for. And having this, uh, you, would then, uh, you would then arrive at the configuration space XC, which is a two manifold. A manifold is a lower, lower dimensional uh, space. So if you think of the, of the Earth's surface, again, this is a manifold, a two dimensional manifold in the three dimensional space. So now for the augmented bonding curve, you would start as, as I said here before with the four dimensional space, and now you land because you apply two restrictions, you land in a lower space, a two-dimensional manifold. And in this configuration space, um, the states um, um, follow these restrictions. Okay, uh, so uh, next thing that you would do introducing the bonding curve, you would introduce mechanisms. You would say agents are allowed to bond to use the bond to mint mechanism. They're allowed to use the burn to withdraw mechanism, allocate with rebond or deposit mechanism. And what would then happen is, this is what the, what the paper proposes, is that uh, regardless what happens, if you bond or uh, if you burn or if you, if you mint token, uh, with your action, you would always have the spot price as the realized price. So this is a strong property saying that you would actually realize uh, what you intend, what you designed the, the configuration, the, the bonding curve to do. Okay, so what would be the next step? The next step would be to, to, um, to attribute or to, to admit that um, 
uh, that the, the games that are played, the interactions with the, with the bonding curve taking place are in fact economic games. So uh, there was a follow-up paper published uh, in January 2019, which was also accepted as a conference paper for the, uh, for the Marvel Conference 2020 which says, okay, now the interactions of the agents on the sh shared space can be linked to game theory. So we can interpret the, uh, um, the game as a, as a sys this, uh, system, right? And we can say that the agents who play, they tell us something about the world. So they signal us what they want to do. Because if you look at a, a specific bonding curve example, you don't really know what, the, uh, you don't really pre-assume what, what the people or the agents uh, really uh, want to do. You just observe what they are doing. So you say, okay, there's someone buying, there's someone selling, but these um, interactions can be interpreted as a game and their actions can be interpreted as signals. And these signals would then again estimate uh, what um, a, a property of the system that you cannot observe. So it would tell you something about um, about uh, the whole system as a, uh, the whole system as a whole. So what is the realized price by only observing what the agents do by interacting uh, with the bonding curve? So in this paper, we we make use of the machinery that we introduced before. So we again make the configuration space available. We, this, these are the same equations that we had before, uh, but we say that we have the system level configuration space, but also we have the agent level configuration space. So what the system can do, what the agents can do, they all together form the configuration space, which is the Cartesian product of these two above. And then you let them play without really knowing what they want to do, but they want to, let's suppose, um, they, they want to, to have to, to, to maximize some, 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 uh, some problem they have. So they want to find for their specific preferences they have, that they want to, um, they, they want to, to sell or buy according to what they believe the, the real price should be or what, what, how much they value the token. And then if you aggregate all of this, um, uh, of the, uh, of these actions, you can conclude that the observed agent actions act as signals. Uh, they can be interpreted as the revelation of preferences. So the agents tell us something about what they really want, what they desire by their actions. And the aggregation of the sig signals can, um, can estimate a hidden property of the system. In this case, it would be the price. So the true price for the, for the token that that we don't know what uh, what it should be. Okay, so what would be the next step then? Next step would be then to con connect this to state-based games. Uh, if you want to connect to state-based games, this is exactly what I said in my introduction. You have a shared sa state space and you let agents play games on top of it. This is something that has been investigated already. And you have to, to look at evolutionary game theory. So evolutionary game theory describes how large populations of interactions, uh, strategically interacting agents behave. Um, we would uh, introduce some kind of revision strategy for the agents. We would say, okay, they will change their strategy according to what they observe in the system. And then we could have, uh, we could use this to aggregate the dynamics we can do it deterministically or stochastically. Uh, and the, the questions at hand would be on stability, convergence, stochastic stability, and non-convergence. Based on that, you would go into state-based potential games, uh, where you see that in the definition of a state-based potential game, you already have this X, which is the shared uh, space that all the agents observe. So you see that the state-based game, there is a set of agents, and you have the agents here, and an underlying finite state space X. And then they have some action sets so they can do something. And then you would have utility functions so they value something. But then you have a shared state space where everything, uh, everyone observes it. And you have a transi transition function. So the F that we had before was here called P. So you say, the, uh, you say that the state changes over time. And this, uh, this is uh, exactly the, the, the uh, the branch of, of theory that we can uh, we can we can use to uh, to connect to the to the framework that we developed in the papers. And lastly, 
if you have this, you can talk about distributed control. So you can say that the game theory has been applied in the traditional agenda and in economics and social scientists to describe what's going on. But in the engineering agenda, it can be applied to distributed control. And in the end, this is what we as token engineers, as complex system engineers want to achieve. So we want to build or design a system in a way that we know how to control, maintain it or to lead it into future states such that it evolves in a way as we intend it to do. So this would be it. I hope that uh, the introduction and the outlook uh, weren't uh, too, um, let's say, too, 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 too quick or too, 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 too much rushed. But I'm happy to, to use the last eight minutes or so to, uh, to answer your questions if you have any. Thanks, Chris. Uh, very theoretical, but very interesting background to me. Um... Do we have any questions from chat? I don't think so right now. If you have any, please either raise your hand or post them in the uh, Discord chat. All right, Brendan, uh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? I can unmute you too if you want. Uh, oh no, I think you have to click yourself on unmute. Oh, wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can. Oh, great. Um, first question, this is a minor side. Uh, is there a recording of this? Uh, yes, there are recordings of this and they will be shared. Yeah, cause, I, uh, Cause I'm not getting any of the video uh, of the presentation. Um, so my, my, uh, my question really is, uh, are you uh, developing any platform for this? Um, I mean, it's all theoretical in terms of algorithms, but are what are the implementations that you're seeing um, all of these constructs uh, being put into? Yeah, um, thank you for this question. Uh, so, what is happening here? I can I can show the augmented bonding curve, which you can uh, which you can retrieve from the command stack. Uh, you can this is this would already be an implementation here, so you can really play around with this. Uh, parameters and you can see how the token bonding curve would uh, would change and how you can set up your specific market depending on the on the use case that you want to apply it to as i said in the beginning uh, one of the most pop popular use cases is uh, the funding replacing icos right so you can say that you want to initialize a project and you want to say okay according to the, these parameters you can choose how much the price of the token will increase depending on how many people already contributed. So this is uh, one thing that you can do. And then you can run simulations with it and you can say, okay, what are the possibilities and that how the system can, uh, how this funding can, uh, can evolve over time. And if you run the simulations, you will see that every simulation run will, uh, will tell you uh, something different because obviously it is only a simulation based on the parameters that you, that you put in. Uh, you can take it for granted that uh, your, your financing or your, um, your funding phase would be, will be successful. It depends on, uh, on stochastical events, but you can get a feel of what can happen over time. So this would be one of the implications that I can show you very briefly. But if you talk about um, about this, so if you talk about the engineering aspect, here we have um, a big. Um, this is actually our research that's going on here. So, so, so this digital twin would be, I would say, an applied program of your ecosystem. So if you are someone who wants to develop um, an ecosystem, if you are asking questions, how things will uh, might evolve over time, we would suggest you to get engaged with us and to, um, to let us develop a digital twin of your economy. So then you and your, uh, your project team can play around with it and see, okay, how specific design choices will influence um, the evolution of the system. So this would be obviously something that we say, this is architecture of a system. This is system design. This is something that you should do accompanying your project um, that you are doing. Hey, Christoph, uh, pleased to meet you. Uh, so my name is uh, Brendan Moss. I'm a Media Lab alum. And uh, I know Michael and I uh, are aware that, you know, there's the CAD CAD ecosystem for uh, doing simulations. Uh, I'd like to, uh, 
be able to, uh, you know, touch bases with you. Um, maybe we could figure out how we can do that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can get in touch with me. I believe that there is, um, I mean, you can obviously write me an email to, uh, to, to my university address. You can get in touch with me on Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever, um, or but even here in, in a conference, we can, we can grab some time and, and, and chat around. Um, so I'm happy to, 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 to talk to anyone who's interested in these issues, right? Yeah, this, it's uh, really tremendous stuff. Uh, you know, people have no idea. I'm is. excited that you are excited. So this. Uh... Yeah, I, I have a, I have a, my background is in uh, well as an undergrad it was originally in uh, biology and neuroscience. Okay. Uh, and then um, actually I was one of the first 150 people in the world doing virtual reality in okay. 1993. And um, so I've you know I'm all things uh, computation assembly on up to AI and um, and cybernetics. So. Uh, Perfect. I yeah. Completely get what I completely get what you're talking about. This is very nice to hear. I was a little bit curious um, who and how many people are attending or listening. I don't know this, but uh, I'm happy to see that there is uh, someone who who appreciates what you're doing. Great. I'll, I'll be in touch. Perfect. Yeah. Hey, I see another raised hand. Um, somebody who wants to ask a question, please unmute yourself. Hey. Hello. Hey. Hello. Did you, did you want to ask a question? Yeah. Can I? Please. Okay. Hi, Chris. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Python. I'm an architect. We used to do um, agent-based modeling like 10 years ago. So now I'm uh, trying to bridge this uh, digital world with the physical world. And uh, through a blockchain, uh, we're trying to develop uh, contracts uh, so that uh, people can interact with these contracts, let's say buy products, mm -hmm. and uh, materialize uh, digital layers on, on the physical world. And uh, okay, I, I was a bit aware about the bonding curves, but this is the first time I actually understand a bit more about this. And uh, I, I think that um, it, it, it creates a lot of opportunities. So what I want to do now is uh, to use these uh, tools and try and see in what way we can apply architecture in a mass, uh, in, in, a, in a planetary level, using uh, people as uh, co-architects. Um, yeah, this is very exciting. I mean, um, this is actually what you describe here is um, also our mentality are also our idea so this is what we try to develop as well it um, most, most of the things happen in the background so as you can see this is the research is heavily mathematical it's heavily simulational uh, so it, it doesn't look so pretty when you talk about formulas or talk about variables but um, uh, on the meta level we're talking about the same things and, and i'm very excited to to meet you here and uh, we can join forces if you're interested uh, give me a call and um, we can talk deeper about uh, whatever you want to discuss. Okay, there is a, uh, I'm doing this is that uh, because uh, a couple of days ago we actually came in, into let's say uh, an understanding with the city, and uh, we're, we're uh, doing a memorandum of uh, understanding so that uh, we can uh, apply this uh, new uh, architecture uh, uh, process to strengthen the local economies and do some behavioral change uh, on, on uh, to let's say promote behavioral changes to citizens and try to find alternative ways to strengthen the economies so yes i i would like to strengthen this uh, scientific uh, community of ours and uh, yeah perfect happy happy when you get in if we get in, in touch very right. excited about this and I also believe that uh, we can uh, also show our our projects that we're doing in the applied field. We have the city of Vienna token going on, uh, so which is also something that uh, intends to change behavior in the city. And uh, I hope that, and I think that this is something that we can talk about. Yeah. Great, great. Thanks a lot.